Chapter 8 The day hunting season opened, I was as nervous as Sammy, our house cat. Part of that seemingly endless day was spent getting things ready for the coming night. I cleaned my lantern and filled it full of oil. With hog lard, I greased my boots until they were as soft as a hummingbird's nest. I was grinding my axe when Papa came around. He smiled as he said, This is the big night, isn't it? It sure is, Papa, I said, and I've waited a long time for it. Yes, I know, he said. I've been thinking. There's not too much to do around here during the hunting season. I'm pretty sure I can t take care of things, so you just go ahead and hunt all you want to. Thanks, Papa, I said. I guess I I'll be out pretty late at night, and I'll probably have to do a lot of sleeping in the daytime. Papa started frowning. You know, he said, your mother doesn't like this hunting of yours very much. She's worried about you being out all by yourself. I can't see why Mama has to worry, I said. Haven't I been roaming the woods ever since I was big enough to walk? And I'm almost 14 now. I know, said Papa. It's all right with me, but women are a little different than men. They worry more. Now, just to be on the safe side, I think it would be a good idea for you to tell us where you'll be hunting. Then, if anything happens, we'll know where to look. I told him I would, but I didn't think anything was going to happen. After Papa had left, I started thinking. He doesn't even talk to me like I was a boy anymore. He talks to me like I was a man. These wonderful thoughts made me feel just about as big as our old red mule. I had a good talk with my dogs. I've waited almost three years for this night, I said, and it hasn't been easy. I've taught you everything I know, and I want you to do your best. Little Anne acted like she understood. She whined and saved me a wash job on my face. Old Dan may have, but he didn't act like it. He just lay there in the sunshine, all stretched out and limber as a rag. During supper, Mama asked me where I was going to hunt. I'm not going far, I said, just down on the river. I could tell Mama was worried, and it didn't make me feel too good. Billy, she said, I don't approve of this hunting, but it looks like I can't say no. Not after all you've been through, getting your dogs and all that training. Oh, he'll be all right, Papa said. Besides, he's getting to be a good-sized man now. Man? Mama exclaimed. Why, he's still just a little boy. You can't keep him a little boy always, Papa said. He's got to grow up some day. I know, Mama said, but I don't like it, not at all, and I can't help worrying. Mama, please, don't worry about me, I said. I'll be all right. Why, I've been all over these hills, you know that. I know, she said, but that was in the daytime. I never worried too much when it was daylight, but at night, that's different. It'll be dark and anything can happen. There won't be anything happen. I said, I promise I'll be careful. Mama got up from the table saying, Well, it's like I said, I can't say no and I can't help worrying. I'll pray every night you're out. The way Mama had me feeling, I didn't know whether to go hunting or not. Papa must have sensed how I felt. It's dark now, he said, and I understand those coons start stirring pretty early. You'd better be going, hadn't you? While Mama was bundling me up, Papa lit my lantern. He handed it to me, saying, I'd like to see a big coonskin on the smokehouse wall in the morning. The whole family followed me out on the porch. There we all got a surprise. My dogs were sitting on the steps, waiting for me. I heard Papa laugh. Why, they know you're going hunting, he said. Know it as well as anything. Well, I never, said Mama. Do you really think they do? It does look like they do. Why, just look at them. Little Ann started wiggling and twisting. Old Dan trotted out to the gate, stopped, turned around, and looked at me. Sure, they know Billy's going hunting, piped the little one, and I know why. How do you know so much, silly? asked the oldest one. Because I told little Ann that's why, she said. And she told old Dan. That's how they know. We all had to laugh at her. The last thing I heard as I left the house was the voice of my mother. Be careful, Billy, she said, and don't stay out late. It was a beautiful night, still and frosty. 
A big, grinning Ozark moon had the countryside bathed in a soft, yellow glow. The starlit heaven reminded me of a large blue umbrella, outspread and with the handle broken off. Just before I reached the timber, I called my dogs to me. Now the trail will be a little different tonight, I whispered. It won't be a hide dragged on the ground. It'll be the real thing, so remember everything I taught you, and I'm depending on you. Just put one up a tree, and I'll do the rest. I turned them loose, saying, Go get them! They streaked for the timber. By the time I had reached the river, every nerve in my body was drawn up as tight as a fiddle string. Big-eyed and with ears open, I walked on, stopping now and then to listen. The way I was slipping along, anyone would have thought I was trying to slip up on a coon myself. I had never seen a night so peaceful and still. All around me, tall sycamores gleamed like white streamers in the moonlight. A prowling skunk came up, wobbling up the riverbank. He stopped when he saw me. I smiled at the foxfire glow of his small, beady red eyes. He turned and disappeared in the underbrush. I heard a sharp snap and a feathery rustle in some brush close by. A small rodent started squealing in agony. The nighthawk had found his supper. Across the river and from far back in the rugged mountains, I heard the baying of a hound. I wondered if it was the same one I had heard from my window on those nights so long ago. Although my eyes were seeing the wonders of the night, my ears were ever alert, listening for the sound of my hounds telling me they had found a trail. I was expecting one of them to bawl, but when it came, it startled me. The deep tones of old Dan's voice jarred the silence around me. I dropped my axe and almost dropped my lantern. A strange feeling came over me. I took a deep breath and threw back my head to give the call of the hunter. But something went wrong. My throat felt like it had been tied in a knot. I swallowed a couple of times and the knot disappeared. As loud as I could, I whooped. Woo-wee! Get him, Dan! Get him! Little Ann came in. The bell-like tones of her voice made shivers run up and down my spine. I whooped to her. Woo-wee! Tell it to him, little girl, tell it to him. This was what I had prayed for, worked and sweated for, my own little hounds bawling on the trail of a river coon. I don't know why I cried, but I did. While the tears rolled, I whooped again and again. They straightened the trail out and headed down the river. I took off after them as fast as I could run. A mile downstream, the coon pulled his first trick. I could tell by my dog's voices that they had lost the trail. When I came to them, they were out on an old drift, sniffing around. The coon had pulled a simple trick. He had run out on the drift, leaped into the water, and crossed the river. To an experienced coon hound, the crude trick would have been nothing at all, but my dogs were just big, awkward pups trailing their first live coon. I stood and watched, wondering if they would remember the training I had given them. Now and then I would whoop, urging them on. Old Dan was having a fit. He whined and he bawled. He whimpered and cried. He came to me and reared up, begging for help. I'm not going to help you, I scolded, and you're not going to find him out on that drift. If you would just remember some of the training I gave you, you could find the trail. Now go find that coon. He ran back out on the drift and started searching. Little Ann came to me. I could see the pleading in her warm, gray eyes. I'm ashamed of you, little girl, I said. I thought you had more sense than this. If you let him fool you this easily, you'll never be a coon dog. She whined, turned, and trotted downstream to search again for the lost trail. I couldn't understand. Had all the training I had given them been useless? I knew if I waded the river, they would follow me. Once on the other side, it would be easy for them to find the trail. I didn't want it that way. I wanted them to figure it out by themselves. The more I thought about it, the more disgusted I became. I sat down and buried my face in my arms. Out on the drift, old Dan started whining. It made me angry, and I got up to scold him again. I couldn't understand his actions. He was running along the edge of the drift, whimpering and staring downriver. I looked that way. I could see something swimming for the opposite shore. At first, I thought it was a muskrat. In the middle of the stream, 
where the moonlight was the brightest, I got a good look. It was little Anne. With a loud whoop, I told her how proud I was. My little girl had remembered her training. She came out on a gravel bar, shook the water from her body, and disappeared in the thick timber. Minutes later, she let me know she had found the trail. Before the tones of her voice had died away, old Dan plowed into the water. He was so eager to join her, I could hear him whining as he swam. As soon as his feet touched bottom in the shallows, he started bawling and lunging. White sheets of water, knocked high in the moonlight by his churning feet, gleamed like thousands of tiny white stars. He came out of the river onto a sandbar. In his eagerness, his feet slipped in the loose sand, and down he went. He came out of his roll, running and bawling. Ahead of him was a log jam. He sailed over it and disappeared down the riverbank. Seconds later, I heard his deep voice blend with the sharp cries of little Anne. At that moment, no boy in the world could have been more proud of his dogs than I was. Never again would I doubt them. I was hurrying along, looking for a shallow riffle so I could wade across. When the voices of my dogs stopped, I waited and listened. They opened again on my side of the stream. The coon had crossed back over. I couldn't help smiling. I knew that never again would a ringtail fool them by swimming the river. The next trick the old fellow pulled was a dandy. He climbed a large water oak standing about ten feet from the river and simply disappeared. I got there in time to see my dog swimming from the opposite shore. For half an hour they worked that bank. Not finding the trail, they swam back. I stood and watched them. They practically tore the river bank to pieces looking for the trail. Old Dan knew the coon had climbed the water oak. He went back, reared up on it, and bawled a few times. There's no use in doing that, boy, I said. I know he climbed it, but he's not there now. Maybe it's like Grandpa said. He just climbed right on out through the top and disappeared in the stars. My dogs didn't know it, but I was pretty well convinced that that was what the coon had done. They wouldn't give up. Once again, they crossed over to the other shore. It was no use. The coon hadn't touched that bank. They came back. Old Dan went up the river and little Ann worked downstream. An hour and a half later, they gave up and came to me begging for help. I knelt down between their wet bodies. While I scratched and petted them, I let them know that I still loved them. I'm not mad, I said. I know you did your best. If that coon can fool both of us, then we're just beat. We'll go someplace else to hunt. He's not the only coon in these bottoms. Just as I picked up my axe and lantern, little Ann let out a ball and tore out down the riverbank. Old Dan, with a bewildered look on his face, stood for a moment looking after her. Then, raising his head high in the air, he made my eardrums ring with his deep voice. I could hear the underbrush popping as he ran to join her. I couldn't figure out what had taken place. Surely little Ann had heard or seen something. I could tell by their voices that whatever it was they were after, they were close enough to see it and were probably running by sight. The animal left the bottoms and headed for the mountains. Whatever it was, it must have realized my dogs were crowding it too closely. At the edge of the foothills, it turned and came back toward the river. I was still trying to figure out what was going on when I realized that on striking the river, the animal had again turned and was coming straight toward me. I set my lantern down and tightened my grip on the axe. I was standing my ground quite well when visions of bears, lions, and all kinds of other animals started flashing across my mind. I jumped behind a big sycamore and was trying hard to press my body into the tree when a big coon came tearing by. Twenty-five yards behind him came my dogs, running side by side. I saw them clearly when they passed me, bawling every time their feet touched the ground. After seeing that, there was nothing to be scared of. Once again, I was the fearless hunter, screaming and yelling as loud as I could. Get him, boy, get him! I tore out after them. The trails I knew so well were forgotten. I took off straight through the brush. I was tearing my way through some elders when the voices of my dogs stopped. Holding my breath, I stood still and waited. Then it came, the long, drawn-out ball of the tree bark, 
My little hounds had done it. They had treed their first coon. When I came to them and saw what they had done, I was speechless. I groaned and closed my eyes. I didn't want to believe it. There were a lot of big sycamores in the bottoms, but the ones in which my dogs had treed was the giant of them all. While prowling the woods, I had seen the big tree many times. I had always stopped and admired it. Like a king in his own domain, it towered far above the smaller trees. It had taken me quite a while to find a name suitable for the big sycamore. For a while, I had called it the chicken tree. In some ways, it had reminded me of a mother hen hovering over her young in a rainstorm. Its huge limbs spread out over the small birch, ash, box elder, and water oak, as if it alone were their protector. Next, I named it the giant. That name didn't last long. Mama told us children a story about a big giant that lived in the mountains and ate little children that were lost. Right away, I started looking for another name. One day, while lying in the warm sun staring at its magnificent beauty, I found the perfect name. From that day on, it was called the Big Tree. I named the bottoms around it the Big Tree Bottoms. Walking around it and using the moon as a light, I started looking for the coon. High up in the top, I saw a hollow in the end of a broken limb. I figured that was the coon's den. I could climb almost any tree I had ever seen, but I knew I could never climb the big sycamore, and it would take days to chop it down. There had been very little hope from the beginning, but on seeing the hollow, I gave up. Come on, I said to my dogs. There's nothing I can do. We'll go someplace else and find another coon. I turned to walk away. My hounds made no move to follow. They started whining. Old Dan reared up, placed his front paws on the trunk, and started bawling. I know he's there, I said, but there's nothing I can do. I can't climb it. Why, it's 60 feet up to the first limb, and it would take me a month to cut it down. Again, I turned and started on my way. Little Anne came to me. She reared up and started licking my hands. Swallowing the knot in my throat, I said, I'm sorry, little girl. I want him just as badly as you do. But there's no way I can get him. She ran back to the tree and started digging in the soft ground close to the roots. Come on now, I said in a gruff voice. You're both acting silly. You know I'd get the coon for you if I could, but I can't. With a whipped dog look on her face and with her tail between her legs, little Anne came over. She wouldn't even look at me. Old Dan walked slowly around behind the tree and hid himself. He peeped around the big trunk and looked at me. The message I read in his friendly eyes tore at my heart. He seemed to be saying, You told us to put one in a tree, and you would do the rest. With tears in my eyes, I looked again at the big sycamore. A wave of anger came over me. Gritting my teeth, I said, I don't care how big you are. I'm not going to let my dogs down. I told them if they put a coon in a tree, I would do the rest, and I'm going to. I'm going to cut you down. I don't care if it takes me a whole year. I walked over and sank my axe as deep as I could in the smooth white bark. My dogs threw a fit. Little Anne started turning in circles. I could hear her pleased, whimpering cry. Old Dan bawled and started gnawing on the big tree's trunk. At first it was easy. My axe was sharp and the chips flew. Two hours later, things were different. My arms felt like two dead grapevines, and my back felt like someone had pulled a plug out of one end of it and drained all the sap out. While taking a breather, I saw I was making more progress than I thought I would. The cut I had started was a foot deep, but I still had a long way to go. Sitting on their rears, my dogs waited and watched. I smiled at the look on their faces. Every time I stopped chopping, they would come over. While little Ann washed the sweat from my face, old Dan would inspect my work. He seemed to be pleased with what he saw, for he always wagged his tail. Along about daylight, I got my second win, and I really did make the chips fly. This burst of energy cost me dearly. By sunup, I was so stiff I could hardly move. My hands and arms were numb. My back screamed with pain. I could go no further. Sitting down, I leaned back against the tree and fell asleep. 
Little Anne woke me up by washing my face. I groaned with the torture of getting to my feet. Every muscle in my body seemed to be tied in a knot. I was thinking of going down to the river to wash my face in the cool water when I heard a loud whoop. I recognized my father's voice. I whooped to let him know where I was. Papa was riding our red mule. After he rode up, he just sat there and looked me over. He glanced at my dogs and at the big sycamore. I saw the worry leave his face. He straightened his shoulders, pursed his lips, and blew out a little air. He reminded me of someone who had just dropped a heavy load. In a slow, calm voice, he asked, Are you all right, Billy? Yes, Papa, I said. Oh, I'm a little tired and sleepy. Otherwise, I'm fine. He slid from the mule's back and came over. Your mother's worried, he said. When you didn't come in, we didn't know what had happened. You should have come home. I didn't know what to say. I bowed my head and looked at the ground. I was trying hard to choke back the tears when I felt his hand on my shoulder. I'm not scolding, he said. We just thought maybe you had had an accident or something. I looked up and saw a smile on his face. He turned and looked again at the tree. Say, he said, this is the sycamore you call the big tree, isn't it? I nodded my head. Is there a coon in it? He asked. There sure is, Papa, I said. He's in that hollow limb. See, that one way up there. That's why I couldn't come home. I was afraid he'd get away. Maybe you think he's there, Papa said. I believe I'd make sure before I cut down a tree that big. Oh, he's there all right, I said. My dogs weren't ten feet behind him when he went up it. Why are you so determined to get this coon? Papa asked. Couldn't you go somewhere else and tree one? Maybe the tree would be a smaller one. I thought about that, Papa, I said. But I made a bargain with my dogs. I told them that if they would put one in a tree, I'd do the rest. Well... They fulfilled their part of the bargain. Now it's up to me to do my part. And I'm going to, Papa. I'm going to cut it down. I don't care if it takes me a year. Papa laughed and said, Oh, I don't think it'll take that long, but it will take a while. I'll tell you what I'll do. You take the mule and go get some breakfast. I'll chop on it until you get back. No, Papa, I said. I don't want any help. I want to cut it down all by myself. You see... If someone helps me, I wouldn't feel like I kept my part of the agreement. An astonished look came over my father's face. Why, Billy, he said, you can't stay down here without anything to eat and no sleep. Besides, it'll take at least two days to cut that tree down, and that's hard work. Please, Papa, I begged, don't make me quit. I just have to get that coon. If I don't, my dogs won't ever believe in me again. Papa didn't know what to tell me. He scratched his head, looked over to my dogs, and back at me. He started walking around. I waited for him to make up his mind. He finally reached a decision. Well, all right, he said. If that's the way you want it, I'm for it even if it's only an agreement between you and your dogs. If a man's word isn't any good, he's no good himself. Now, I have to get back and tell your mother that you're all right. It's a cinch that you can't do that kind of work on an empty stomach. So I'll send your oldest sister down with a lunch bucket. With tears in my eyes, I said, Tell Mama I'm sorry for not coming home last night. Don't you worry about your mother, he said as he climbed on the mule's back. I'll take care of her. Another thing, I have to make a trip to the store today and I'll talk this over with your grandfather. He may be able to help in some way. After Papa left, things were a little different. The tree didn't look as big as my axe wasn't as heavy. I even managed to sing a little as I chopped away. When my sister came with the lunch bucket, I could have kissed her, but I didn't. She took one look at the big tree, and her blue eyes got as big as a guinea's egg. You're crazy, she gasped. Absolutely crazy. Why, it'll take a month to cut that tree down, and all for an old coon. I was so busy with the fresh side pork fried eggs and hot biscuits. I didn't pay much attention to her. After all, she was a girl, and girls don't think like boys do. She raved on. You can't possibly cut it down today, and what are you going to do when it gets dark? I'm going to keep right on chopping, I said. I stayed with it last night, didn't I? Well, I'll stay till it's cut down. 
I don't care how long it takes. My sister got upset. She looked at me, threw back her small head, and looked up to the top of the big sycamore. You're as crazy as a bedbug, she said. Why, well, I never heard of such a thing. She stepped over in front of me and very seriously asked if she could look in my eyes. Look in my eyes, I said. What do you want to do that for? I'm not sick. Yes, you are, Billy, she said, very sick. Mama said when old man Johnson went crazy, his eyes turned green. I want to see if yours have. This was too much. If you don't get out of here, I shouted, you're going to be red instead of green, and I mean that. I grabbed up a stick and started toward her. Of course, I wouldn't have hit her if for anything. This scared her, and she started for the house. I heard her saying something about an old coon as she disappeared in the underbrush. Down in the bottom of my lunch bucket, I found a neat little package of scraps for my dogs. While they were eating, I walked down to a spring and filled the bucket with cool water. The food did wonders for me. My strength came back. I spit on my hands and, whistling a coon hunter's tune, I started making the chips fly. The cut grew so big I could have laid down in it. I moved over to another side and started a new one. Once, while I was taking a rest, old Dan came over to inspect my work. He hopped up in the cut and sniffed around. You'd better get out of there, I said. If that tree takes a notion to fall, it'll mash you flatter than a tadpole's tail. With a no-care look on his friendly face, he gave me a hurry-up signal with a wag of his tail. Little Anne had dug a bed in a pile of dead leaves. She looked as if she were asleep, but I knew she wasn't. Every time I stopped swinging the axe, she would raise her head and look at me.